If the C to N ratio is low, and by low I mean a 10 to 1 ratio, it means the nitrogen supply is so great that the micro microbial populations proliferate and they use up all the carbonaceous material present in the soil as the most available food source. So you put out, let's say for example, soy manure, which is very, has a very low ratio. The microbes gobble it up really quickly. There's not much left over to actually, you know, then add organic matter to the soil. So good, crop, good for crop production, but it does not directly add to your soil organic matter levels. However, increased biomass production via some kind of cover crop uh, can, have a, can have a good impact on your soil organic matter. So liquid swine manure typically has that 3 to 1 to 8 to 1 ratio. Really good for growing crops. Man, lots of P, N, P, and K out there. They can utilize it really quickly, but it gets used up and burned up so fast in the system because there's not enough carbon in the system, it doesn't typically build your organic matter levels in and of itself. Now I've got a producer that I work with a lot by Mitchell, and he's actually going to be at the Soil Health Clinic with me uh, coming up here in a few weeks. But what he does with his hog manure is he always makes sure that he's putting it on a field where he can put cover crops on. So he's using his cover crops to then bring that carbon back into the system. So that's, a, that's kind of something important to realize. If you're using something that's got this real low ratio, if you want to truly build organic matter out there, you're going to need to figure out another way to introduce more carbon back into it besides just the manure itself, okay? Well, we can be on the other end of the spectrum too. We can be too high. We can have a real high ratio that I'm talking about, typically over 20 to 1. Uh, for a good example is like wood chips, you know, we're talking about sometimes ratios up to 30 to 1. A good example is that over in Minnesota a few years ago, the, a lot of the dairy guys got into doing uh, compost barns for their dairy cattle, where they'd use wood chips as a bedding source. They'd go in there like once or twice a day with a rototiller and till that up. So it was great bedding for the cattle, great for the somatic cell counts, good for the dairy health of the animal. What they found out though, the first few years, they started putting that on their crop fields. They had so much carbon in the system compared to the nitrogen, the ratio was so out of whack on the other end that their crops became nitrogen deficient. They actually had to go back out there and side dress nitrogen and keep adding nitrogen to the system because the microbes were binding up all of that you know, carbon material and they just weren't releasing it back to the plant. So on the one end, if we're too low, we're not getting enough carbon back in the system to build organic matter. If we're too high, yeah, we can build organic matter, but we're going to hurt our crop production, okay? So you got the two extremes. So where's the sweet spot? Well, the sweet spot is typically kind of between a 10 to 1 to 20 to 1 ratio. And this is ideal because there's a sufficient amount of carbon and nitrogen for both the microbes and also the crops. And this is an ideal range where we can help build our soil organic matter without hurting our crop production. So, what are some things that kind of have that ratio? And again, these are all kind of just, you know, they're ranges. You really aren't going to know what your manure carbon to nitrogen ratio is unless you go test it. And that is a test you can have run. So next time you take a manure sample, uh, depends on what company you're using, like uh, DHI, you know, on their card, you can check, you know, carbon to nitrogen ratio, and they'll run that for you and tell you what your ratio is. But Things like turkey litter, 9 to 1 to 15 to 1. Uh, liquid cattle manure, 10 to 1 to 16 to 1. These are typical ranges we would see. Solid cattle manure out of an open lot, 12 to 1 to 18 to 1. And then solid uh, bed pack, you know, this is coming out of a bed pack barn, 15 to 1 to 25 to 1. So it can kind of get a little high sometimes, and that kind of depends on how much bedding you're using. Are you processing the bedding before it's being put into the cattle barn? And again, until you actually test it, you're not going to know. But truly from building soil organic matter out there on the landscape, that's a pretty good product. It's got a lot of organic matter in it, but yet you've still got your nutrients that you know, can help with crop production. So it's all about finding that sweet spot. So that's kind of the number I want you to remember. If you can get in that 10 to 1 to 20 to 1 ratio if you're applying manure, that's probably going to be a good, a good sweet spot to be. Before I go on, does that make sense? Does everybody understand that concept? You kind of see where I'm going with that? Okay. So, 
How much carbon is any 1% of the soil, how much carbon does it take to increase your soil organic matter by 1%? So if we do a little math, a one acre slice of soil at a depth of 6.7 inches weighs about 2 million pounds. 1% of that is 20,000 pounds. So organic matter contains roughly 58% carbon, right? 1% organic matter in a soil at 6.7 inches equals 11,600 pounds of carbon. So we'd need about 11,600 pounds of carbon to increase our soil organic matter 1%. For those of you who are more well versed on this than I am, did I do my math right there? Anybody, everybody follow that? Everybody agree with that? Okay. So this is a little chart I found that shows the different types of manures. Um, we got solid dairy manure, liquid dairy, liquid hog, solid broiler, and here's the carbon to nitrogen ratios. What they were trying to get at here was how many tons of manure would you need to apply to maintain your soil organic matter level. So this is the tons or gallons of manure you'd need to put on to maintain your soil organic matter level. So where's those sweet spot numbers? Yeah, 17 to one, we said we wanted to be in that 10 to one to 20 to one ratio, right? So these two are pretty good. And it takes 15 tons of solid dairy manure or 9,000 gallons of the liquid dairy. So that, that makes sense. And if we look at our NPK down here, those are not unreasonable. You know, we're, we're gonna be building phosphorus. You know, it typically takes about 20 pounds of phosphorus to raise your soil test level about one part per million. So we would be raising it, you know, you know, five parts per million here, probably seven or eight here. But that's still, that's reasonable. We understand we're gonna do that. Nitrogen's not out of whack. So that makes pretty good sense. You could be putting that on, meeting your crop needs, Maintaining your soil organic matter, matter, not degrading the environment, right? So kind of a, a sweet spot again. Let's look at hog manure. 3.7 to 1 was the ratio on this. Need to put on 23,000 gallons per acre to maintain your soil organic matter level. Is that reasonable? Probably not a lot of hogs out here, so I don't have probably as many comments, but no, that's pretty high. Typically, we see three to 5,000 gallons per acre would be typically what you'd apply from a hog finishing barn to meet your nutrient requirements of that crop. Look how many pounds of nutrients we're putting on. 400 pounds of nitrogen, 500 pounds of phosphorus. That would raise the soil test level 25 part per million in one application. So this is unreasonable. Nobody would ever put it on this high. Number one, you'd burn your crop up, but number two, you'd really be degrading the environment as well. So, so the take home message here is again, by looking at those ratios, if you're strictly looking at putting on a rate for organic matter level, it really isn't possible to do that strictly by just using this type of manure. You'd have to incorporate again cover crops or some other kind of carbon into the system to balance this out in order to do that. Okay? Does that make sense? Everybody follow me? So uh, Fred Magduff and Harold Van Ness in their book, Building Soils for Better Crops, um, they outlined that they were doing some research and they said about 20 tons per acre per year of solid dairy manure will increase your organic matter level 0.65% per year. So under this scenario, it would take approximately 15 years to raise your soil organic matter 1%. So they've done lots of research. And that's a really good publication. If you haven't read that, you should Look it up, it's a free, you can download it from SARE, uh, the PDF format. So yeah, they're saying it's possible to definitely increase our soil organic matter levels using manure. And that particular scenario took about 15 years, okay? Are there other ways to build soil organic matter even faster? Um, Dwayne Beck always talks about a systems approach and I believe fully in that and I think the same principles apply here for raising organic matter levels. We can do it with just strictly manure, we can do it with just strictly no-till, we can do it with just strictly cover crops, but when you get some synergies going by mixing those things all together, you can do it even faster. What would be the number one thing we do? We heard this, uh, Dave Franzen gave us lots of good examples about soil erosion, right, and how much nutrients you've already sent off to other places. Well, we definitely want to prevent soil erosion, that's number one. If we've got this going on out there, um, I don't care how much manure you pump on there, it's just going to keep degrading, right? No-till, no, no-till organization here, so you guys are fully 
well versed in that, I definitely believe that's important. Keep that soil in place. Keep that back. To those uh, keep those soils going. More diverse crop rotation. It seems like the more diverse we get our crop rotations, the more that system gets going, the more those microbes get going. And I think our organic matter levels keep keep increasing. Another good reason for a more diverse crop rotation. I kind of work the whole state of South Dakota. I get out in this country or you know, even Mitchell country. We don't have so much trouble with getting the manure out because a lot of guys still have small gray in their rotations. When I get to that far eastern, you know, two or three counties in from Iowa and Minnesota, it becomes a battle every year and it seems like it's getting worse and worse all the time. Everybody's corn beans. What happens when you get a fall like this where it's wet and you know, half the corn didn't come off till after Thanksgiving time and then try to get your manure put on. It's a real struggle. So, Another great advantage of having some small grain in the rotation um, is you can get your manure out there in a timely manner. You don't have to wait until you know, the ground freezes and the snow on the ground. Cover crops have all kinds of benefits. We've talked about those today. Um, this is a good example. My neighbor right across the road, he pulled into that field. I said, I gotta come check this out. And, and that was rye he put in the year before, pretty late. He'd put that on actually after he'd combined corn, it was probably the second week in November, didn't get much fall growth, but in the spring that really came on, it was a pretty wet spring. That's a pretty wet field. Um, he just pulled right in there though, and he was said, went right through the whole thing, no problem, came back, sprayed it off, actually had some of the best looking beans uh, I saw that year, it really, uh, really made a difference on that field. So there's some of the great things, including increasing organic matter that uh, the cover crops can do. Okay, so I'm gonna pose a question to you guys. How fast can we grow organic matter in our soils? Well, the answer is depends. Uh, is it possible to expect one to 2% soil organic matter in a decade if we'd use a combination of diverse rotations, no-till, manure cover crops? I'm asking you guys, you've probably, some of you have been no-till for many years, and maybe some of you have manure as part of your rotation. Do you think that's a reasonable number to shoot for? Yep, Dan says it is possible, but you kind of got to do everything right. And would you say, Dan, it's probably important that you'd have to have kind of all those things mixed together? Correct. Yep, correct, absolutely. Do you guys have some manure in your, in your system at all that you use? Yeah, but not all over. Just sure. Around the house, around yep. the Do you see a advantage there? A lot of advantage, especially on phosphorus. You bet, yep. Good. Anybody else have any experience, real world experience where you've kind of tried these things in combination and seen any benefits? I do think it's possible. I think, again, it depends on where you're at in the state. It depends on, you know, a lot of different things, weather, and it depends on how well we put these things together, get those synergies. But, um, you know, the research is showing 1% for sure, I think, in a decade is possible if you do things right. 2% would be on the upper range. I think that would really be hitting the, the home run with everything probably, but you know, it, it certainly could be possible. So, something to strive for. So if, we're, uh, if we've used up 50% or 60% of our organic matter over the last 100 years, all is not lost. We obviously have an opportunity to go back into those degraded soils and uh, build that organic matter back. Are we ever gonna get back to seven, eight percent? That would probably be a stretch, but we can definitely go from 2% to three or 4%. That makes a huge difference, so. Yep, there's absolutely an opportunity for us to do that. So let's talk about some of the additional benefits of manure out there. Um, obviously, the, you know, it provides NPK, sulfur, lots of micronutrients. It can increase organic matter by increasing that carbon. Increases water infiltration. Yeah, a lot of times you'll see the, the, where manure has been placed, if it's been done right, it definitely increases that profile, better aggregate stability better bulk density, so it definitely can increase our water infiltration. Gives us a little more of that drought resistant, kind of acts like a sponge a little bit out there. Better structure, better aggregate stability, definitely. Reduces compaction, it certainly can. If you had, uh, especially I've seen, I had a guy I work, worked with that had a field that's pretty, had some pretty bad compaction, pretty high clay content. After about three applications of, he was using kind of a bed pack bar material, and he was incorporating, he wasn't a no-till guy, but uh, he actually could definitely see some major structural improvement on that soil by getting that organic matter level increased and getting that uh, tilt back to the soil. 
And, you know, manure is kind of the ultimate uh, old slow-release fertilizer. I think those benefits I said about the, the cornfield I watched for five or six years, you're definitely getting, you know, some nutrients released for a long period of time. Um, nitrogen probably only for two or three or four years, but uh, certainly you're seeing some additional benefits from the phosphorus and potassium that stays in the, it stays in the profile. And that increases in microbial and enzymatic activity. Those are all important things for manure. Some other positives, sustainability. Um, you know, hey, it's kind of the old, I got a book from my grandpa that I think was 1923 or 24 about how to grow corn. And they, uh, <clears throat> they talk, uh, you know, they had the, you know, plant the crop, you know, put the manure on there. They didn't even talk about synthetic or commercial fertilizers because they weren't even around yet. So I think our ancestors kind of already were doing some of this. Unfortunately now what they were doing is, you know, still mow board plowing and some of those things. But if we can grow the crop, feed it to some livestock, put that manure back out there and grow some more crops, hey, it's the ultimate sustainability cycle. And then we throw in our technology we've got with our seeds, our herbicides, uh, our, our machinery. Man, we can really bring this thing home, can't we? You know, most nitrogen fertilizer comes from fossil fuels, so by inc incorporating manure back into our system and livestock, we're kind of, we're kind of uh, getting away from some of that. Here's one that's always intrigued me, and I don't know, you can find different sources that say different things, but you know, phosphorus typically comes from a mine situation, right? They mine it out of the ground. And uh, there are several places where they're estimating that we only have you know, about 100 years left of mineable phosphorus in the world. And I've seen anywhere from 100 to 500 years, so believe whichever source you want. But irregardless, at some point in time, we are going to run out of mineable phosphorus. You, you just won't be able to go down to the you know, store and say, hey, bring me some phosphorus out. Well, then what are we going to do? I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> but that's going to be an interesting uh, pickle we're going to be in because we're going to have to keep putting phosphorus out for our crop fields. If we can't just buy it and put it on, we're going to have to get it from somewhere. Well, manure is one possible source. So. And then it can provide an economic incentive to diversify farming enterprises. Um, I work with a lot of producers from all across the state. Um, probably the one that I've enjoyed working with the most, or the group that I've enjoyed working with the most, is when we get some young folks coming back to the farm, and a lot of times that's only made possible by adding another enterprise or increasing the enterprise, and livestock seems to be a great way for young folks to get back. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that uh, are against the hog barns and against the feedlots and all that, but, you know, we're an ag state, and if you want young folks to come back, they can't buy, you know, on the eastern side, you know, $10,000 an acre crop land. This is a way for young folks to come back is by diversifying bring some livestock back into the operation, and then that can basically then, you know, kind of help with the crop production as well, so. Well, with everything, there's always a pro and a con. Uh, what are some of the negatives of manure? Well, there are some. It's an inconsistent product, right? You know, and, and if you don't, uh, you know, if you don't handle it right or, or apply it right, you can definitely get some inconsistencies out there in the field. That can cause some issues. So that's one of the things we have to overcome. It's labor intensive to handle. It takes a little more work to go out there and you know, handle manure two or three times and spread it to just call up the fertilizer truck and have them spread it. So I would definitely agree with that. Possible odor issues. And again, that's more of an issue when you get into the populated areas, but uh, we're definitely seeing some counties where that's becoming an issue. They're, they're starting to kind of hold back on the livestock sector because of potential odor issues. Water quality impairment issues. Sure, any nutrient, whether it's manure or commercial fertilizer, if we don't handle it correctly, if we don't apply it correctly at the right you know, rate, time, source, and place, it's gonna cause some issues. So we have to be cognizant of that. As an industry, we have to try to do a good job making sure we're not impairing our water quality. And that's one of the things NRCS works with producers on, developing that nutrient management plan, providing some cost share assistance to make sure we can get it out there in a proper manner. And then, you know, some things we don't maybe always think about, but we're hearing more about all the time. Uh, potential producing bacteria into the, into the systems, especially with the antibiotic resistance. Uh, I don't know if you guys followed, but uh, there's been a couple of cases of E. coli salmonella issues with, like, lettuce in the last couple of years. And they actually have said some of that they're tracing back to possibly they were putting manure on those fields. So actually they've talked about a ban on any uh, manure application on vegetable crops. So 
So those are all things to think about, you know, so um, it's, not a, it's, not a perfect, it's not a perfect product. We have to be cognizant of those things. Public perception, you know, that's a big one. Um, if we don't do things right on the landscape, the public is probably going to get after us, and that's happening in some places. So we have to be, again, good stewards whenever possible. So we follow the principles of the four R's of nutrient management within RCS. Uh, the right, putting the right source at the right rate, in the right time, in the right place. If we can do those four things, typically, we can capture the benefits of manure without any of the negatives. What's the right source? Well, it depends on who you are. If you're a gardener, that's probably your right source. You can go and buy your bag of cow manure. If you're a livestock producer or a crop farmer, this might be the way you do it, a little more larger scale. Is there any difference? Well, not really. It's just the size and the scale of what we're doing. So I always get a kick out of people that complain about seeing the farmer doing this, even though he's doing a heck of a job. I guarantee that thing is doing a much better job than the little spreader I was using 40 years ago when I was applying the dairy manure but they have no problem going down to Walmart and buying a bag of cow manure for their garden. So, again, perception and how we look at it as a, as a society. The right rate, you know, just, just getting yourself dialed in to what the right rate is. And I'm just giving you some visual examples. This is what 20 tons looks like. And that's what 66 tons looks like. A lot of folks just haven't got themselves, you know, calibrated. That's one of the things we can help you out with. We have some portable scales. Um, if you want, we can always come out to your farm, help you weigh up your spreaders, you know, figure out what exactly the rate you're putting on, figure out exactly what the nutrient content is and, and uh, how much you're actually putting on there of N, P, and K. You know, here again, that's about kind of a typical rate for beef manure, 15 to 25 tons would be very typical. You start getting up to 66 tons, and you can't probably see that, but there again, we're putting on 528 pounds of phosphorus. So we're increasing our soil test levels, you know, 25 parts per million. So after two or three applications of that, your phosphorus is off the charts. You're probably higher than you'd ever need to be agronomically. You're almost starting to teeter on that area where you can have some environmental issues when you get up that high. So it's just awareness, you know, just uh, coming out there and helping you guys get those things figured out is what we like to do. So we're always glad to do that. Is there a right time and a wrong time to put manure on? Sure, yep. Sure is. That's a good time, right? Is this a good time? Well, sometimes from a logistical standpoint, it might be a good time. That's the only time you can get out there. That's when you got more time to haul manure. But more and more all the time, public perception is telling us this is not a good idea. And research is telling us that is not a good idea. From all the studies kind of across the Midwest, whenever you put uh, manure on top of a frozen or soil or snow covered or frozen surface and then you get more snow or rain on top of that you know, think about the March thaw if this is sitting there in March and it starts to thaw where's it going to go it doesn't usually go in does it It usually goes off so so this is something we're really trying to get away from um, some states have flat out banned winter application South Dakota you still can but again trying to make sure we're putting it in the right spot if we're doing that so we don't have issues down the road so the right place, um, again, would be, you know, in an ideal situation would be out there, you know, setting up zones and we'd be applying our manure into, you know, exactly those correct zones where it's needed. We do these little water quality risk assessment maps and we develop a nutrient plan. Basically what we do is identify areas that are water conveyances. So if you have a, a drainage ditch or a waterway or a tile inlet, whatever it might be, we'd like to stay at least 100 feet back from those. So you don't have that direct conduit into the water source in the spring when water runs off or when you get a rainfall event in the summer. So just being smart, using common sense. If we do that, we can keep using manure as a great resource and not get in trouble. So, okay, real quickly, I want to talk about kind of phosphorus management. And in my mind, phosphorus management really is soil management because what does phosphorus typically do if it's not in the if it's not in a real high concentration, your soil it typically binds up you know, to your particles, your soil, your cations, and it stays there. Now, if you get a situation like this where most of your soil is leaving your field, then you're probably sending all that phosphorus right along with it, right? So we don't necessarily want to see that. This is kind of uh, my short list of things we can do as producers 
on the landscape to try to keep that phosphorus out there where it's needed by our crops. Number one, just keep our soil test levels reasonable. In South Dakota, um, you know, we say 50 parts per million on the Olson, 75 in the brain. Now that's higher than you need agronomically by quite a bit, double, just about double. But, you know, back in the days when DENR was coming up with their state permit, there was quite a bit of dialogue between DENR and SDSU and NRCS and some of the research Ron Gelderman did, you know, kind of said if you, if you stay under those levels, you probably are going to not have a real big issue with environmental impact as long as your soil stays in place. In other words, your, your phosphorus isn't going to go into solution. It's not going to move like nitrogen. You can get that situation. Some of these soils, if they get super saturated, uh, they're finding that out in Lake Erie now with all the issues out there. They've, put, they've got such a rich history of livestock production. There are some of their phosphorus levels are two, three, four hundred parts per million. When it gets that high, the soil just can't hold it anymore. All the sites are basically saturated. And then actually that phosphorus will move just like nitrogen. It moves through the profile, moves through the tile lines. So that's why we want to make sure we don't let our soil test levels get too high. And there's no reason agronomically you need to be any higher than that. So keep those in mind. Any kind of conservation practice we can do to keep that soil in place is very important. You know, embracing the variable rate technology, I think we're seeing a lot more guys all the time doing the zone sampling, grid sampling, setting up, you know, their, their, their units so they can apply their nutrients exactly where they're needed. And that's fantastic. You know, install buffers or filter strips along your waterways, lakes, rivers, and streams. Oh, about three or four NRCS chiefs ago, Paul Johnson, he was from, I think, Wisconsin, originally a farmer from Wisconsin. He always had this saying, and I always liked it, he always said, farm the best, buffer the rest. I think that's a good saying, you know, if you've got those really sensitive areas right along a river, a creek, a lake, whatever it might be, you know, put a 50-foot grass buffer along there. It's not going to probably take up that much land. There's actually some good programs through CRP and Equip and stuff where you could do that. But you can gain a lot of benefit from an environmental and a water quality standpoint and also a great public perception thing. You know, you don't have to be, know much about ag to know if you're, if the guy's field cultivator is dragging along the, into the creek when he's driving along, that looks a lot worse than if there's a nice 50 foot grass buffer there from the, the public, so. And then again, minimizing our manure and fertilizer application on snow covered and frozen soil is also an important thing. Okay, let's talk about nitrogen management real quickly. And I kind of look at nitrogen management as water management, because what does nitrogen typically do? kind of moves around where the water is, right? It's kind of a, it's kind of, kind of the same as water. It moves around, phosphorus kind of stays with the soil if it's not in too heavy a concentration. But nitrogen kind of moves around with the water. So what can we do to help out and keep that nitrogen on the landscape? Again, applying the right rate is really important. Timing, I think, is probably one of the most important things with nitrogen. You know, if we have soils that are prone to high leaching, and that's one of the things we identify when we're doing a nutrient management plan. Do we have those high leaching soils, those you know, sandy soils, maybe, or something over the big Sioux aquifer, where if we've got a lot of nitrate in the profile, there's a real potential for it to leach down. You know, over there, a lot of the guys will work on like a split application regime where they put on some, some urea, probably at planting time or before planting time, but then they'll come back and do some side dressing in season side dressing. So just some things like that can make a big difference. You know, you can look at doing some of the inhibitors, either in urease inhibitors or nitrification inhibitors. I think cover crops have a big place um, in the nitrogen game. You know, if we're, let's just take the manure example. If we're going out there after wheat, putting on um, a big slug of manure, if we've got a cover crop planted on that field, if we do have some of that free nitrogen floating around, Instead of leaching down, that nitrogen kind of, that cover crop can sequester that nitrogen and hold it in place and then it can be released the following year or so. And installing some edge of field remediation practices, um, things like denitrifying bioreactors, created wetlands, drainage water management. These are some things that are really getting looked at hard. Probably not so much here yet, but as you get into like Iowa, Illinois, the, the big I states, you know, they've got that that nutrigen, nutrient reduction strategy because of the hypoxia issue down in the Gulf of Mexico. They're targeted, they're supposed to re reduce their N and P by like 45% in the next, whatever, decade or two. 
which is not, that's not possible, number one, but in order to decrease anywhere near where they need to be, they're gonna have to look at some of these kind of things. So I always say if you're you know, installing new tile, which isn't a big deal out here, but for the east it is, be thinking about maybe the right time to put in a bioreactor or something like that is actually when you're doing that tile installation. That's when you can really get it to fit in there nice, so. Whoops. Okay, so there are some additional resources. Take a picture of it. If you want to, or write it down. Uh, if you want to research a little more some of the stuff I was visiting with you about here today. And you've got the presentation in front of you. There's my contact information, so I'm gonna, before I leave, offer you some free stuff. So, what can I offer you that's free? I'm from the government, I can't offer too much, but. I could write a nutrient management plan for you if you guys have a livestock facility that you're permitted with DNR. You know, a lot of guys are working through their new permits right now. Um, 2017 DNR came out with their new permit, so if you need a nutrient plan updated, call me, I can help you with that. If you have a livestock operation that has a feedlot or something, and you've ever thought about maybe designing a containment system for your, system, for your feedlot, my team does that as well. And it just starts with a phone call. Email me your phone call. We'll come out. We're not regulatory. It's very important to remember, NRCS is not regulatory. We come out, look at your operation. If we can help you out with some things, we will. If we see the biggest train wreck in the world and you say, I don't want to do anything, that's fine too. We're not going to turn you in. We're not going to report you to DNR. We're just there to help you if you want help. So that's the first thing I can offer you, some free technical assistance if you want it. Um, I can offer you a free manure sample. So if you've never sampled the manure on your operation, if you have livestock, give me a call. I've got a little grant right now. I can actually pay for the manure sample. We can run that carbon to nitrogen ratio for you. So just give me a call or email me. I can either send you a kit or I can come out and help you pull it, whatever you want to do. The one thing just came to me today, uh, I think because of our first speaker, I thought, hey, that's a good idea. I'm going I'm to jump on that. He talked about, have you ever dug a soil pit on your farm and looked at your profile? Anybody ever done that? Dan has? Did you learn something from that? Yeah, Worthwhile, isn't it? So what I'm going to offer you here is we actually have a little mini excavator. We can go down about 10 or 12 feet. If anybody is ever interested in digging a soil pit, um, you know, call me up, let me know. Give us a little forewarning, because we use that to dig our sites when we're doing our ag waste systems, but I'll definitely get you on the rotation when we're in your area. We'll swing by and we can dig you a little pit wherever you want it dug to look at your profile, your, your field, and maybe you can learn something from that too. So there's my three freebies for today. So.